Hi there, I'm Corinne. Um, I just like to. I'm just interested. In, I know a lot of people are um, training in upholstery here, but how many of you have come from different creative backgrounds? Okay, and is that feeding into the upholstery work that you're doing now, or is it <coughs> ticking away in the background? Okay, good. Um, so I'm the founder of Frame and Cover. Frame and Cover is um, a home furnishings brand that is bespoke UK-made um, products, but using only sustainable materials um, to make our products. And I came from a textiles background. I trained in Weave at Manchester Metropolitan. And I then went on to get a job at Marvick Textiles as a textile designer. And from there, I went to Laura Ashley. And at both of those places, I um, had the experience of going into big manufacturing facilities making fur furniture and fabric um, and it's where there I kind of learned most of my biggest lessons I'd say in some respects um, so this image um, represents well two things basically the curved sofa you see in that image was one of the first pieces that I designed at Laura Ashley um, it was a bit of a tussle with the senior buyer and it eventually went through and it became one of the best-selling pieces um, of that season and for a while afterwards. And that kind of gave me the confidence in my vision and design-wise and also gave me the confidence to stick to my guns. Um, this also illustrates uh, the room sets that we used to put together at Laura Ashley. And in the lower room sets that used to go to smaller stores, we were able to experiment a little bit more with um, what we put on the upholstery. Um, so I was the one that was um, responsible for putting, putting together the briefs and um, for the season and also designing the fabric. I also did cabinet furniture and in the end lighting too. And we used to go to Welbeck, which is Laura Ashley's main upholsterer, um, to go and modify the shapes and with them as we were developing them for the season. So it was there that I sort of learned a bit about frame making and the first time I saw a commercial upholstery line and how that looked. And a little bit, I learned a little bit about the fillings, but one of the other things I also came up against was the constraints of working to retail margins and how that can impact on the design and the products that you come out with at the end. Like one example would be that we wanted to use feather cushions, but in the end, because of cost, we had to supplement them for foam with a feather wrap. It's that kind of thing. And I became aware of wanting to try and promote, you know, more eco products for the high street. And it became difficult to do that. Um, Partly because the quality control team deemed that um, things had to be consistent. So, for example, I tried to get a reclaimed wood range into, into the range and that got kicked out because not every piece was the same. And they deemed that the Laura Ashley customer wanted something that was consistent and therefore the same. I mean, to me, it's part of the charm that it had a nick here and the wood grain looked different there, but I'm not so. And I think... That was kind of when I started realising that trying to promote um, sustainable products to people was maybe going to be a little bit difficult, trying to educate them and to get them to understand um, why you were using the materials that you were doing, basically. Um, oh, oh dear, sorry, you had the bed So I worked for Laura Ashley for three years and during that time I started to think about my own career progression and I decided to, I had an old chair that my gran gave me and I wanted to get it upholstered. I found out how much it cost and decided to do it myself. <laughs> um, so I went and did a week long upholstery course and that is the result. As you can see it's not terribly well done. Um, <laughs> but again that's where I started playing around with the idea of mixing fabrics on a chair. Um, what came out of that though was that I did fall in love with the process and the stories that chair t chairs tell and also giving them a new lease of life. My friend still has that chair unbelievably as well. Um, so I went on to then go and start 
the London Met Upholstery course. And again, as you can see, I carried on experimenting with mixes of fabrics. Um, these two fabrics you see on the chair here, I designed myself. And I decided that I wanted to try and combine my love of designing textiles with doing upholstery. And how could I do that going forward in a more business manner? Um, London Met is brilliant because they have an accelerator programme there. And that programme um, supports students and ex-students in business support. So I learned about branding, I learned about marketing, how to um, write a business plan, all of these aspects of business that you don't learn about really when you're a student. And that's, yeah, so initially I started the business programme thinking that I was going to re upholstered chairs in either client <coughs> chairs and then find my own chairs to re upholster in a format, probably something similar to that, and try and sell them. Because I, I still work part time and I did then as well, I realised that trying to find source old chairs and then um, spend the time reupholstering them, finding the fabric, um, was going to be costly, time consuming. Um, and so I sort of went back to what I'd previously done and started thinking about actually having chairs manufactured instead. Um, so, yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> um, I started off by designing my own fabric collection. That's actually the collection that I launched last year. But because I had this idea of sustainability and I've been learning about the materials on the upholstery course and I started questioning why sustainable materials weren't used in more mass manufacture, I decided that I was going to find a base cloth that, to print on that was sustainable. Most of the digital printers I approached didn't have base cloths like that, so I decided to source my own. I went back to mills that I'd worked with previously and just put out there that I was looking for this fabric and eventually I found the fabric that I now use, which is recycled cotton and recycled polyester, and then found a printer that was happy to um, stock hold my fabric for me. And after a bit of trial and error, we had issues with fluffy fabric, you know, testing, all of these things that you don't really think about when you're just buying fabric. Um, I eventually got to a point where I'd honed it down and it was, it was a good product, it was able to go, so that was like, brilliant. Um, then, so this box represents, this is a beautiful box that you can get from NCAV that is all of the sustainable material, well, a good portion of the sustainable materials that they do. Um, while I was designing the fabric collection, I was still on the accelerator program and um, I initially thought I had the idea of mixing sustainable, well, giving the customer choice of having sustainable fabrics, um, sorry, fillings or foam. But I sort of thought about it and it really went against all of my principles and I never really liked working with foam and so I decided actually I was just going to purely make it sustainable products. I'd already started doing that with the fabric so why not with the chairs. Um, however, what that meant then was trying to find a manufacturer that was willing to use sustainable materials. And I went back to my old Laura Ashley contacts and asked them if they would be willing to use sustainable materials in the making of the chairs. And what I found was that because they're so used to using foam and that's what they stock hold, that's what they buy a lot of, that by introducing sustainable materials that it was kind of disrupting their production line and therefore was you know, it wasn't worth it for them because it was too costly and therefore they kind of weren't interested in it, basically. So I went back to an old tutor and he had links with a frame maker and so we started making frames and then went on to do all the upholstering side of it. But what happened then was because he was kind of more or less a one-man band and I wanted to scale the business that the cost prices ended up coming out too high, or, which then meant the retails would have been more, would have been higher than I would have been happy selling it at, basically. So that left me with a bit of a dilemma. I then had to go and find someone else. So luckily, 
Jude and Hannah and their love of Prosecco at Tent <laughs> and their positioning um, opposite a more commercial contract um, furniture manufacturer meant that I met my manufacturers that I now work with and they were really into the idea of using stable materials and were fully behind my vision. So we started again prototyping which believe me costs money so <laughs> But it had to be done. I was so committed to doing this now that I was like, too far down the line, I've got to see it through. So that's what I did. And so we took the old, front, the old pieces that I'd done with the other upholsterer and worked from them to then produce these. Um, as you can see here, we've got elasticated webbing in this one, um, which I kicked out because I was like, I can't see a way of this being able to be returned to the ground or recycled. So that got replaced. Um, quite often we would modify our chair frames um, or shapes by drawing on them. So there's all these different ways that we, would, you know, we were working on the, the pieces. Um, yeah. So he, here are all our chairs together. <laughs> so that's how many prototypes we basically went through in order to try and in order to get the shape right. Um, yeah, so that's that. And then this is kind of what I go through as a designer, basically, and how I go about you know, designing a piece. So a lot of it's down to my personal style, what, I'm, you know, what I think, and also what I think might sell. But then I also take a look at what's in the market and ultimately you want to be able to produce something that's got a little bit of a variation and different offer to what's out there already. And I also think about where it might sit in the house. What use has it got? Uh, so at that point, we then was set, prepare a brief and um, design word drawings, dimensions, any other you know, sort of details that need to be added. I'd also think about how I want the placement of the fabric to go onto the chair at this point as well. They would then send me back basic costings. We would discuss it and see if there was anything that could possibly cause an issue in terms of a slightly bigger mass pro production kind of thing. Um, and then we go to prototyping, so like the chairs you saw just then, and at that point we probably just get a frame, well we would just get a frame made, but still looking at the proportions of the frame, so front, back, side, does it look like it's in proportion? If not, second frame made. If it does, yay, go to upholstery. So. Then we take it up to the calico stage, and then again you look at when it's fully upholstered, whether the proportions then again look right, and you sit in it, does it feel, is the lumber right in the back, and you find, is there enough supports in the seats, and go back to the thing of Serpentine Springs earlier, is that, does it feel like it's comfortable, is there enough springs in there, and it's all these things that you're thinking about when you're modifying the chairs. Um, one thing that I, I'm slightly guilty of is I'm quite picky, so I'd have to learn when to give up, you know, to call it a day and be like, it's fine as it is. I have to try and remove myself from it and look at the piece and be, if I had ever seen that detail, would I notice it? So then that's the sort of thing I'm thinking about when I'm looking at the chair. Does it really matter if I don't change that one thing that's slightly niggling me right now? Um, and then the chair would get upholstered in the final, fa final fabric and we'd sign it off. Uh, then make a, we'd call, I call it a chair recipe, but it's everything that goes into making the chair and to recording it. So exactly what materials have been used, uh, even down to the leg stain and the beeswax and things like that. So these are the chairs that are in the current collection. Um, so each season I would design new fabrics and I upholstered, well, get the chairs upholstered in these. Um, so like I was saying, every single component in the chair is considered, um, can it be recycled, can it be returned to the ground? So like my leg stain, for example, is an eco leg stain. So I try and pay attention to every detail that goes into these chairs. Um, what these represent is three years of trying to get the business to launch and that's how long it took 
probably actually a little bit longer from the point where I actually started, where the idea started in my head. So it takes a while um, to get to this stage. These are the fabrics that I launched last year. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite proud of these chairs, I have to say. <laughs> um, so, I just wanted to touch on some of the challenges of having and motivations of starting your own business. So, one major thing is the freedom to be creative. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. It's nice, especially after having worked for quite high pressure retailers, to be able to do something that I felt had integrity and also wasn't going to harm the planet really mattered to me. Um, and that then goes neatly on to promoting sustainability. So asking people to think about the materials that they use or, and the products that they buy. It's like, does anyone really know what goes into the chair that they sit on? People take it for granted. You know, I like sitting down as much as the next person, but what is really in our chairs? So then also asking other design professionals to think about it. I mean, there's a, we all know there's a massive conversation about plastic at the moment. And so I feel like people are slowly kind of waking up to the issue of, you know, disposing of products that have reached the end of their life. Um, so hopefully this can you know, it will continue. Um, one thing you aren't told about when you start up your own business is exactly everything that goes into doing it. And, you know, for me in particular, I, I'm, not partic I'm not a wordsmith, um, certainly not when writing it, but you need things like press releases and the wording that goes onto your website. So you have to reach out to people, use your contacts, use your network, and ask them to help, because people by and large do want to help, and that's a really lovely thing. And so knowing where, where where your limits are is not a bad thing. It's just simply what it is. So find people that can help you. Um, selling and marketing. So for me, cold calling people, cold calling interior designers, press buyers, um, you know, I sort of struggle with, but I'm getting better at it. <laughs> but it's those kind of things that you have to do as well. And it's, that again is just practice. I did two trade shows, um, London Design Fair and Design Junction. And whilst they were useful, um, one of the best things that came out of it was chatting to other small businesses and finding out that everyone was in the same boat as you. They might be a few years on from you, so had got through the kind of period that you're in and getting reassurance and chatting to other people is, is really important. Um, obviously, trade shows are also quite good for getting in front of people, getting brand recognition, um, but they are expensive and you know, sometimes you might not get the results that you had hoped for out of it. So it's trying to weigh up what is your best way to sell and I think that's an ever evolving thing. Hopefully at one point you might get it and you'd be like, yes, but you have to keep on trying until you get to that point. Um, managing customers, so I guess this is kind of down to customer service, it's key and how you interact with your customers and how um, you respond to them. I had one issue where a fabric got upholstered the wrong way and I decided that I couldn't let the customer have it even though she wouldn't actually have noticed. But it was like I had to tell her and it was, it was hard <coughs> but I was like I have to do this because you know this is going against my business principles if I don't. And so that actually goes on to <laughs> managing manufacturers and so that then led on to setting quality control boundaries with them, even to the point of where the piping um, uh, line finished on the front of the chair, was it visible? It's helping them to understand what you expect from your products and ultimately your products are your brand. So making sure that everything is as you would want it to be is important. Um, so not compromising, on, again, that leads on to not compromising what your brand stands for. Um, other aspects of that is packaging. So you can really disappear down a sustainable rabbit hole, but can you find packaging that can be disposed of easily and recycled and that kind of thing? Um, 
it's that's also a part of the business, but also recognizing <coughs> that you're only the size that you are at that particular time. So sometimes you have to compromise a bit until you get to a point where you're able to order volume and therefore it makes it more cost efficient. It's trying to weigh up all of these things at the same time. Um, and confidence. So when you design something, when you upholster anything, you're putting a bit of yourself out into the world. And it's just taking heart and just going, no, it's all right, I've done a great job on this. And we're all evolving, especially as upholsterers. You get quicker, you get better, you get a keener eye for detail. But that doesn't mean that what you've done previously is any less good than what you're doing now. It's just going, this is having confidence with it and doing it. Um, which is also lovely when you start getting press recognition. I was particularly happy last May when this image turned up in the Observer magazine. Um, and then just recently, I also do rugs as well, as well as fabric by meter and cushions. And my rug got used in the recycled materials feature for homes and gardens this month, which was really heartening. So it's always lovely when you things like this happen because it helps you, even if sales might be a bit slow in coming, like I'm on the right trajectory, hopefully. So there we go. Thank you. Some of you might have a few questions for Corinne. Yes, one hand goes straight up. Mm. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for, for your uh, presentation. Um, I think it's really interesting and really helpful. Um, I have a question about the uh, product that you showed us uh, before. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions. Um, the frames, uh, is, the, is the wood certified? Yeah, FSC certified beach, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in terms of the certifications, are there other certifications in the UK for like green upholstery or sustainable upholstery? Are you using any labor or steel? Or um, not really. Um, there are people, and I'm sort of having conversations with people, but it tends to be in the architecture trades where I can't remember what the testing and the certificates that they have to have, but there's more build pertinent buildings. Um, there doesn't really seem to be anything on the eco side of for upholstery that I've managed to find out about. Um, it's not to say that there isn't, but not that I've, not that it's widely known anyway. So the fabric that I use on my chairs, the base cloth, is um, Okio Tex 100, which basically means that nothing harmful has been used in the making of the fabric. You know, there's a whole bit about how they have to achieve the OKO Tex 100 certificate but yeah I guess how I do it is you know promoting the materials that I use in the chair so not using foam using cocoa lock instead um, using a wool interliner on it that kind of thing it's trying to be as open to people as possible about the materials that go into the chairs basically when you look at sustainability also in terms of the processes, for example, all the aspect that mm -hmm. managing waste. Yeah, waste see, issue, this is. Yes, I would like to, but this is what I'm sort of talking about the rabbit hole. So, what is slightly tricky when you're a small business is that you want to be able to be doing all of these things. And remember, I, I'm trying to manage my manufacturers, so trying to find people that can make your product as well as follow all of the protocols that you would like them to do. And to be quite honest, a lot of people do actually. They've got a certain amount of sustainability um, measures in place and it's becoming a lot more prevalent now as well. But you, you, you're only as good as you, the kind of size that you are. Like, if I get to a point where I'm able, I'm selling a thousand chairs a week or month or whatever, then that's when I'm able to really start laying down my processes. And it's just trying to do as much as you can within the resources that you have. That's basically how I'm working with it at the moment. Yeah. You mentioned Yeah. 
So I'm really lucky, and this is one of the reasons why my current manuf chair manufacturers are brilliant. It was like a lucky ah oh, when I met them because they have really strong links with NKEV. So one of the slightly sad things I believe is that NKEV don't tend to sell to smaller upholsterers. They'll sell to your upholstery suppliers. So. Yeah. Most, they were yeah. 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 You can visit now. They're getting a little bit more open. I think we all just start customer. Yeah. Yeah. I would say well, they're one of their products that we get, and now Martin's. I mean, you had an issue, didn't you, with Martin's? With basically this. No one had actually, they were to yeah. find sort of quite a, a sort of progressive eco. Was it the? It was the, it was, it was made out of plastic bottles. It's made out of plastic bottles. <laughs> it's like it's amazing stuff. Yeah, but, but then they ended up just stopped, stopping spikes. No one was buying it, but then yeah. no one knew they were selling it. So yeah. yeah. NKEV's so website. Start asking and asking. Okay. Yeah, NKEV's website is a great resource. Yeah. They're actually really open about all of their products. So what you could do is go to the NKEV website if you see something you like the look of, then approach your upholstery supplier. And I think this applies to everyone. The more that you're kind of badgering your upholstery suppliers to try and get the materials that NKEV supply, then hopefully the more they'll start listening to people and start supplying it, basically. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was at London Met, I had the choice of what materials I used. So I actually, I think, I actually, I didn't even use foam. I, I had one job after I finished where I was redoing some up, um, some hairdressing chairs, and for price, I had to use it. And then pretty much after that, I was like, I'm not using it ever again. And so. I think making those decisions yourself, hopefully, as well. It, it also comes to chatting to your customers, <coughs> too, and informing them, because no one knows if we don't tell them. So... What's the name of the NKEV. E-N-K-E-V. E-N-K-E-V. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. In terms of foam, obviously, it's plus point and minus point for the same thing that it hangs around forever. Yeah. What in your kind of research have you found that more natural substitutes to be like in terms of longevity? Um, I think they're pretty good. I mean, it's a bit hard to say sometimes. Um, I think they're as probably as long lasting as foam. They might compact a bit longer because they are natural. Really? I mean, if you think about um, traditional upholstered chairs, they were used using coconut hair and yeah. animal hair. The only thing that was different with cocoa lock and rubberized hair is it's got latex on it. So actually, it's just, and you can get different densities of these things as well. Um, so really they should actually last longer than foam. I mean if you you know what it's like when you've ripped it down a chair and it's all just turned into dust and it's it's horrible. I mean as soon as you start sitting on foam it starts degrading. So yeah. And how have you been able to do the FR treatment for a sustainable environmental So I use an I use an insuline on my chairs, walls inherently FR. Um, what I am starting to come up against with, and this is what I'm trying to solve at the moment, is I've had commercial clients contact me, and so it has to meet Crib 5. Um, that's a really hard one, because basically the standard thing is to treat the fabric. and Or, but NKEB also do have an FR interliner that passes Crib 5. Uh, I'm just trying to find out at the moment how environmental that is, whether they also have to put a treatment on it. I would be surprised just because of who NKEV are, but I'm still waiting for that kind of information to come back to me. The way I sort of view it slightly at the moment, and you know, I might be shot down for this, but 
my customers are the ones that are deciding to put it into the environments that they want it to go in. As standard, my chairs pass domestic, um, but you know if they need it to treat you know pass crib five, then at the moment that's the resources that I've got available. So it sort of breaks my heart a little bit. <laughs> it's like it is what it is. Um, Great. Right. Take the applause. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.